Good evening. Welcome to Hastings Mystery Theater. I'm your host and mystery master, Randall Schaefer. Tonight, the corridors of mystery take us way back to 1935 for a Republic movie titled Midnight Phantom. A new police chief is determined to clean up the corrupt police department, but is murdered during a department-wide meeting. Professor Graham tries to solve the murder as others are subsequently murdered. Starring as Professor Graham is B-movie veteran Reginald Denny. He was born in the UK in 1891, and he began his career at the age of nine and made his first movie at age 24 in 1915. During World War I, he was an aerial gunner, and this led to a lifelong interest in aviation. He enjoyed radio-controlled planes. At the outbreak of World War II, he won an Army contract to supply small radio-controlled drones. His company supplied over 15,000 of these little drones during the Second World War. An Army photographer was getting photos of the manufacturing process when he noticed a young woman on the assembly line. He suggested she try modeling. She did. We know her as Marilyn Monroe. Reginald Denny sold his drone company to Northrop. In 1952, and the sale earned him enough money, he never had to work again. He was in his 70s, and he amused himself with guest appearances on TV shows. He died in 1967 at age 75. Let's return to 1935 and enjoy Midnight Phantom. Oh, sorry. Uh, 
I gotta see the chief. Oh, but this is important. Manelli won't mind, will you? No, he won't mind. Well, I thought I sent for Lieutenant. Well, uh, uh. <laughs> Sit down, Burke. <laughs> Thank you. What's on your mind? Maybe I can help you. Possibly. It's about my daughter. Yes. Uh, Diana has promised to be my wife. And we want your consent. You have it. But Diana wants she gets. She said she wouldn't think of marrying me against your wishes. I was afraid that you'd want her to marry Dave Graham. Professor Graham is a very fine man and a successful criminologist. Yes, sir. He's all of that. And that's the reason I was afraid I wouldn't have a chance. I'm only a lieutenant. You know, Danny, I think you're going to be successful, too. I don't know anything about your family, but I've had me eye on you ever since you came on the force. With a wife like Diana, I'm sure I'll reach the top. <laughs> Perhaps I'd better warn you to look out for your job. I've got my eye on that badge you're wearing. Well, keep your eye on it. You may get it. Chief, you don't know how much I thank you. And you never will. That's all right. But I still want to see Bonelli. Oh, yes, sir. You're next. Good morning, Chief. Bonelli, there's too many brawls in your district lately. Almost every night there's a knife in. You know, I got a tough district to handle, Chief. Maybe you can't handle it. Now, sure I can. All I want is a little more time. I got everything pretty much under control. You know, there's a two factions down there. And? How'd you like to go back wearing a patrolman's uniform? Well, I don't like that, Chief. Then listen, Benelli. From now on, I want you to arrest every man down there that looks like he might know what a knife is. Now, that's all. Get out. Oh. Send Finnegan in. Yes, Chief. Uh, maybe you can hear better standing up. Finnegan, I've had my eyes on you for months. Politics is not going to keep any man's job on this force as long as I had it. Now, I'm warning you, Finnegan. Keep your nose out of politics or I'll break you. I know what's running through your mind. You're thinking I won't be long on this job. Well, maybe not. But while I'm here, there'll be no interference from shyster lawyers or underworld bosses. Well, maybe I can give you some advice. I don't want your advice. Now get out of here. Miss Ryan, send Laban in, please. Yes, sir. Levine? If you don't mind, Chief, it's Laban. Well, whatever it is, you've been heading the vice squad for some time. And I understand that you're building quite a pretentious home on the salary you draw. And the police commission is noticing it too. My grandmother died last year in Paris. She left me the money. You may have to prove that. Yes, sir. I'll bring the lawyer's letter to you. Yes, Chief. Get Captain Withers for me, please. Yes, sir. Captain Withers, you're next. Hello, Bill. Hello, Jim. Sit down. Bill, I'm going to relay you with that precinct job. You're going to head the gambling detail. How about Phillips, Chief? I had him on the carpet. It's noised around that there's a payoff. Jim Phillips wouldn't take a dime of dishonest money. But this will break his heart. I have a lot of confidence in Phillips, but I don't want him to remain where he'll be framed by a bunch of crooked gamblers. Phillips won't understand. He'll think you're breaking him. 
He's sort of bitter at times. That's my worry. I can handle him. When he gets through, he'll have every man on the force down on him. Hey, Withers? I guess the chief knows what he's doing. And maybe you benefited by it. That's why you talk that way. Listen, Perkins. Officers who have done their duty don't have to be nervous about what the chief does. He's got the whole department boiling. There's a dozen fellows would like to be pallbearers at his funeral. Miss Ryan, will you come in, please? Is Inspector Silverstein here? He phoned and said he'd be here. What is it, a shake-up? Shake up and down. As I was saying, Mary Ryan's got one of those red-hot Irish tempers. And as a policewoman, she packs a gun. If Sullivan thinks he can go gallivanting around with her daughter late at night and bring her in at all hours of the morning... Kathleen Ryan's the chief secretary. Ne Come on in, David. Hope I'm not intruding. Certainly not. Would you mind waiting in my private office? Thanks. Inspector Silverstein. Come here, please. <clears throat> you have been tried and found guilty of absenting yourself from your post of leave. Now, I'm warning you, if you should let this happen again, you will be severely punished. Well, you see, Chief, it was uh, Rebecca's anniversary, and actually we had some people over for dinner, so now, I... Now, now, that all came out in the hearing. Take your place among the officers. Gentlemen, I am proud to say that we have one of the finest police forces in the country. I know it's not 100%, but I don't know of anything that is. I have seen fit to make some changes today for the benefit of the department in general and officers individually. Some of you may not like it. If not, I'm sorry. I want to congratulate you on having solved a large percentage of crime. Furthermore, I want you to make this town so hot for the crook that he'll find it an unhealthy place to nest in. Do your duty. And as long as I head this department, your jobs will be safe. That's all. Inspector Silverstein. Yes, sir. Come here. Tell Rebecca that I'm sore because she didn't invite me to her party. Also tell her that I'm dropping by some evening soon for cofilte fish and matzo balls. And some sweet and sour pickles and a nice piece of schmaltz, Harry. Keep your seat, David. Will you have a cigar? No, thanks. I prefer my own. <laughs> Here, try one. Thanks. Oh, you're still making them yourself, I see. Of course. My pet hobby. But then, you see, I come by it naturally. My father was a cigar maker. I learned the art when I was a kid working in his factory. Ah, if I were a woman, I think I should go in for very expensive perfumes. But as it is, I have to content myself with fine imported tobacco and roses. Of course, you've heard of Diana's engagement. Sorry, David. But since it wasn't you, I'm glad she chose Burke. He's a clean young fellow. I agree with you. Of course, I wish she'd shown a little better judgment and chosen me, but as it is, I wish them all the luck in the world. That's very kind of you. The next best thing to a winner is a good loser. And I'm sure Diana will always have the greatest respect and affection for you. That will always be my feeling towards them both. Come in. Dr. McNeil from the insurance company. I'll be going. No, 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 that's quite all right. Uh, send him in, please.
Hello, Mac. Sorry to have to have you come down here. All right, I'm glad to get out of Morbid once in a while. <laughs> I want you to meet Professor Graham, Dr. McNeil. Glad to know you, sir. Thank you. Pleasure's mine. Professor Graham is a very successful criminologist and scientific detective. <laughs> He's quite a booster of mine. And deservedly so. I've heard a lot about you, Professor. In fact, I've read of some of your marvelous crime solutions. Well, hasn't anybody a good word to say for my ability? From what I heard out in the hall, you rate pretty low as a chief. <laughs> and from what I know of police, they like to do a lot of talking to other people, but they can't take it themselves. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be fun. Come along, Doc. Let's operate. Huh? <laughs> Thanks for the help, Professor. All right, sit down. And let's try the old pump. <laughs> Hitting on 16 cylinders. <laughs> All right. I will try the blood pressure. There you are. Normal. Uh, let's see, now I guess you better... Are the lamps all right? <laughs> Bet you can see in the dark with those glimmers. All right, the mammoth cave. Perfect as a prima donna's. <laughs> Let's see now, let's try the old bellows. <laughs> good enough for a blacksmith's forge. You sure I'm not too good to live? I don't know. Those kind die young, Chief. <laughs> You've passed that mark. <laughs> well, Chief Sullivan is very busy at present. Will you leave your name? Is it extremely important? Well, just a minute, please. Yes? There's a party on the wire who won't leave a name, says it's urgent. Chief Sullivan speaking. Who is this? I know time for cranks like you. Yes, sir. Place that call, Miss Ryan. Yes, sir. Operator, can you trace that call? Well, Doc, you probably won't think I'm such a good risk now. Fella just threatened my life. Second time it happened this week. Well, you certainly take it casually enough. <laughs> He'll probably follow it up with a threatening letter and then annoy somebody else. You should have traced that call while he was still on the wire. Didn't I tell you he knew he'd stop? <laughs> <laughs> yes? The man's hung up and you know how many calls we have. All right, thanks, Miss Ryan. And goodbye, Chief. Goodbye. Hope you don't collect soon. Thank you. See you again, Professor. I hope so, Doctor. Say, Graham, what about giving us a lecture tomorrow? Tomorrow? I have a pretty full day and a dinner engagement. What about midnight? Hmm? <laughs> Do you think the men can stand it? The kind of lecture I'll want, they'll like. What kind is that? Well, uh, you see, we'll parade a number of um, criminal types in the show-up room. People you've never seen. Oh, yes. And I'm to guess their criminal records from their personal appearance. Is that the idea? Sure. <laughs> Say, that's rather putting me on the spot, isn't it? Suppose <laughs> I should miss. <laughs> you won't. It'll help the officers to pick out suspicious characters at a glance. Will you do it? Okay, I'll be there. Did you want something? Yes. I want you to go home and quit working nights. Well, it can't be done, Chief. Well, you see, there's a lot of correspondence to get out and filing to do. I'll be here till midnight. Out with it, young lady. Mother's terribly suspicious. Of us? Yes. That gambler, Gus Armstrong, saw us together last night. And he's stirring up trouble. Huh. Sorry because I raided his joint, huh? Oh, I'm sorry I told you. But I just don't know what to do about Mother. She's furious. No, no, no. Don't cry. Don't cry. 
I tried to make her understand that there wasn't anything between us. But she just wouldn't believe me. That's all right. Maybe we can make her understand. You can't talk me out of anything, Jim Sullivan. But you don't understand, Mrs. Ryan. Oh, yes, I do. Only too well. And you telling me all the lies. You're not fit to live in a decent home. If the law can't take care of this, I can. You're going to do what any decent man would. Why, you must be out of your head. I'll give you until tomorrow. Go and get your hat and coat. Calling car 71, car 71. Go to 22nd and St. Anne Street. 22nd and St. Anne Street, a barking dog. Calling car 36, car 36. Go to 59th and Rampart, 59th and Rampart. A drunk man beating up his wife. That is all. Hello, Dan. All right, Jones, what's doing? Oh, just enough to interrupt a good story. Barking dogs, crowing roosters, fainting woman, three prowlers, guys beating up themselves, half a dozen drunks and cat up a phone pole and won't come down. Oh, but that looks funny. What looks funny? Half a dozen drunks and a cat up a phone pole. Must be a pole cat. Oh, you're pulling something on me, huh? Here's something interesting. Calling car 22, car 26, car 31, car 47. Disregard all other calls. Go to 72nd and D Street, 72nd and Weaver Street. Oh, bank hold up, bank hold up. Calling car 22, car 26, car 31, and car 47. Bank bandits escaped out King's Highway, hopping in black sedan. Three in car, three in car. Boy and two older men. Take no chances with this gang. Take a look at those other two fellows. All right. How did you get mixed up in a job like this? Well, I was broke, out of a job. They said there wouldn't be any shooting. Oh. Thanks, Danny. You should have come to me. I don't want to go to prison. They might even hang me. They can't do that, Johnny. Well, those two won't do any more hold-ups. Listen. Go call an ambulance, quick. All right, I will. I feel kind of funny. Kind of like I was floating. Well, here, now, take it easy, kid. The ambulance yeah. will be here in a minute. They'll fix you up. I feel pretty good. 
No. It's all right. Everything will be all right. Johnny. Johnny. Come on, darling, shake off the blues. You know, you're an engaged man. Diana, I went through something today that doesn't make me feel exactly cheerful. A young fellow was trapped with a bunch of crooks. He was shot and killed. I understand how you feel, darling. He was only a kid. Told me it was his first job, that he was broke. You know, I'm glad you feel that way, even about that kind of a boy, but... But you'll get over it, won't you? Well, it's late. I, I, mu I must be going. That's father. Hello there. Hello. It's a nice piece of work you fellows did today, Burke. Thanks. I was just saying good night, Chief. Would you mind waiting a few minutes? I'd like to talk with you. Why, I'd be glad to. I'm Thank a little you. tired. Will you excuse me? Well, surely, you run along and get some sleep. Good night, Father. Good night, dear. Oh, Dan, will you look in the morning papers? I gave him the announcement of our engagement. Sit down. Read that. Of course, Dan, you'll release my daughter from the engagement. Release? Release Diana? Yes. It is the only honorable thing you can do. But I love her. All the more reason why you should free her from a compromising situation. But I can't understand why I should be blamed for something my brother did. Then why did you deliberately conceal his identity? Because I knew the people wouldn't understand. Even Diana might not. I like you, Burke. Liked you well enough to give my consent to your marriage to my only child. Please understand me. It isn't because your brother was killed. I'm very sorry that happened. Duty is a hard work, but his being a criminal makes it impossible. But Johnny wasn't a real criminal. He was forced into it. He's only a kid. 
You know the law, Dan. A man was murdered, and he participated in the crime. Why, everybody would point out Diana is the wife of the man whose brother was a murderer. I'll tell Diana and let her decide for herself. You've already deceived her once by not telling her the truth. Well, I'll not release her. Yes, you will, Burke. You'll not trick my daughter into any marriage like this. You can do anything you like, but it won't do you any good. I love Diana and she loves me. And nobody is going to come between us. Not even you, Chief. What are you two quarreling about? Your father is asking me to release you from our engagement. Diana, you'll be fair. You love me, darling. I don't know what to say. Please let me think things over. I tell you, Burke, you'll never marry her as long as I'm alive. Oh, Dad. Dad, please be reasonable. Let me work things out in my own way. I don't want you to marry into a family with a criminal record. It isn't that, Dad. What hurts me is, is that the man I love tried to deceive me before our marriage. Diana, why don't you pack up and take a little trip somewhere? Bermuda, Miami. Or anywhere. <laughs> no, darling, I, I think I'll just go out for a little ride. And don't you wait up for me. It's not safe for you to ride around this time at, of night. <laughs> that, that's not very complimentary to your department's efficiency, is it? You're not going to see Dan Burke? No. No, no, I'm not. And that's a promise. All right. Good night, dear. I've been waiting for you. Expecting me? Doesn't it look like it? I suppose you also know why I've come here. Certainly. I read the evening paper. That'll brace you. David, what am I going to do? You know perfectly well what you're going to do. Only being a woman, you won't admit it. Well, I know... You're going to marry Danny Burke, and you'll be perfectly right. Why are you so sure? Well, after all, he isn't to blame for this tragedy in his family. But why didn't he tell me? Why did he hold things back from me? Try and realize what's running through the poor fellow's mind. He's engaged to a girl whose father happens to be the chief of police and has given his consent, thinking he's going to have a son-in-law he'll be proud of. And then what happens? In the discharge of his duty, he's shooting it out with a bunch of gangsters and discovers that one of them is his own brother. His brother's fatally shot, and he thinks that no one is aware of his identity. Now, what's he going to do? If he tells you or your father, it means an end to all this happiness. Thank you, David. You're awfully sweet. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You know, as a matter of fact, all this explanation business was entirely unnecessary. What do you mean? You would have made the same decision through the proverbial intuition of your sex. <laughs> Good night. Good night, dear.
I hear you're not on the gambling squad after tonight. Hey, Phillips? That's what a man gets for being honest. Transfer to some place out in the bushes. I like to punch Sullivan right in the jaw. That's too good for him. What he needs is a real working over. After all, I ain't got no kick coming against the chief. Because he's been pretty nice to me. Nice, huh? You call that reprimand you got yesterday pretty nice? What would you call a suck in a puss? A love pat? If he thinks he's going to be chief another 30 days, he's crazy. Gus Armstrong's got enough political pull to take care of that. Accused you of playing politics, didn't he? Yeah. Well, what does he think he's playing, pinochle? Listen, my mind's made up and that's that. Diane is of age, and you can't stop us. My daughter will not go against my wishes. She has given me her word. I guess Stan Burke won't be so high and mighty when the police commission put him on the carpet with his kid brother. Sullivan, he get him out of that all right. Burke is going to marry the old man's daughter. Yeah, you got another guess coming. You think Sullivan's going to take on a son-in-law that had a banded brother? Did you hear about Mary Ryan and the chief? Got wives that uh, Sullivan take her out, huh? I was talking to the janitor last night. He said the old lady was threatening the chief, said he'd have to marry Kathleen or else. Ryan. How do you do, Miss Sullivan? Is my father busy? Lieutenant Burke is with him. And that's final, Burke. Not with me. Hello, Danny. Hello, Father. Hello, darling. I've just been trying to convince your father. It's ten to one you weren't successful. I wasn't. I'm the only one who can win an argument with him. But this is one time you won't. But, Dad, it isn't right to blame Dan for something his brother did. I don't. But it's the deception and the compromising of your reputation. Oh, let's leave out my reputation. I wouldn't let gossip keep me away from Dan. And now I'll tell you, just as I told him, and as long as I'm alive, he'll marry you. But, Father, we love each other, and we're going to be married in everything. Captain Withers is here. Send him in. Now, if you'll all excuse me, I'll see you later in the show-up room. <clears throat> Come in, Captain Withers. Pull up your chair and sit down. You saw the newspaper stories? Yes, Chief. I want you to tip me off if Burke and Diana try to get a marriage license. Diana's hard-headed and self-willed. And Burke has indirectly threatened me if I interfere with his marriage plans. Okay, Chief. Anything else? Yes. Something very confidential. The gambling interests are out to get me. Yeah? You know Gus Armstrong. Yeah. He's passed the word to Mary Ryan that everything isn't on the level between Kathleen and me. And the old lady's up in arms. Fire the kid and prefer charges against the old lady if she squawks. Just what they'd want me to do. Play right into their hands. Hmm. That's the setup that knocked over our former district attorney. What are you going to do about it? That's your job, Bill. Just what is there between you and Kathleen? I'm very fond of the girl, but not to the point of marrying. But she thinks she's desperately in love. Armstrong has all the details, huh? Yeah. Mary Ryan actually threatened you? If I didn't marry her daughter. Besides Burke and the Ryan woman, I have had numerous threats by phone. Any idea concerning those? Chuck Finnegan's pretty chummy with Armstrong. And there's a lot of other sore on account of the changes made in the department yesterday. Well, I'll see you here after Graham's lecture. Yes. I have an ace up my sleeve. All right, thank you. Do you mind if I hear Professor Graham tonight? You better go home, Kathleen. It's late. But I have to wait for Mother. All right. But be careful. I will, Chief. You've been pretty white about this situation, Graham. I, I want to thank you. Hmm. 
I've always been interested in Diana's happiness. Father believes in you, David. I wish you could bring me round to our point of view. It's going to be a little difficult, but I'll try. Thank you. Professor Graham, would you mind sitting over here next to Chief? Withers, introduce Professor Graham. Okay, Chief. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us one of the world's outstanding criminologists. Most of us know him as a personal friend who has helped the department solve some of its most baffling problems. Tonight, he will talk on the physical characteristics of the various types of criminals. He will illustrate his talk with a number of prisoners whom he has never seen before. As the prisoners are paraded by him, he will classify them by their physical characteristics. We shall see whether the deductions agree with our records. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor David Graham. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that Chief Sullivan has rather put me on the spot. However, I'll do my best to justify his opinion of my ability. All right, Captain Withers. Duped into crime. Charge. Arrested on suspicion of theft. Record. Served two years in state reformatory. Eighteen months in the Good Shepherd home for the feeble-minded. Oh, come on. Come on. Had his mind been alert, he would never have attempted violence at such an inopportune moment. This type plays a major role in modern crime. Note the thin, sallow face, the listless expression and shifting gaze. He is a very dangerous individual and will commit any crime. He's a drug addict. Charred. Arrested for violation of the Harrison Narcotic Act. Now under arrest on suspicion of gang murder. Hmm. The larger girl is aggressive. If started on a life of crime, she would actively participate with male criminals, drive a bandit car, actors might possibly use a lethal weapon. The smaller girl has no initiative, just prefers the easy life. Charge. The taller girl arrested on suspicion of robbery, known to be a gambler's mall. The smaller girl arrested on a vagrancy charge. He's a very dangerous criminal. Specializes in widows and orphans. Always has a safe investment. <laughs> yes, safe for him. Popularly known as a con man. <laughs> Not a criminal type at all. I wouldn't mind having a dinner date with her. That is, if she'd accept the date. <laughs> Maybe you'd better introduce us first, Captain Withers. <laughs> Professor Graham, my daughter, Mary. How do you do? I'm happy to meet you. <laughs> Well, was your dad in on this deal to baffle science? No, it was my own idea, wasn't it, Father? <laughs> Come on, darling, wake up. The show's over. A very interesting lecture. You seem to have lulled the chief to sleep beautifully. Oh, he's dead. Yeah. What is that? Get him, get him, get him, get him. Right back. Get him back. 
I think she's right. Dr. Kelly! Dr. Kelly! Yes? The chief. The chief. It must have been instantaneous. As he had previous... Why, I... I don't... Lock the doors. Back your seat, everybody. Don't let anyone leave this room. Oh, hand me a glass of water, please. Are you all right, Diane? Yes, yes, I'm all right. Oh, come here. This man has been murdered, and the killer's right here in this room. Back your seats, everybody, and lock those doors. Steady now. We'll sit over here. Looks like a plain case of heart attack. That's what it's supposed to look like, Doctor. But I happened to be in Solomon's office last night when Dr. McNeil examined him and pronounced his heart perfectly normal. Captain Withers, do you know of anyone here who might have wanted a thing like this to happen? Yes, a dozen of them. Including a woman. Stay away from there. He's no good to you now. Clue number one. I'd have been willing to sign a death certificate without an autopsy. I'd have said angina pectoris. But I detect different symptoms now. What would you say offhand? Complete and instantaneous paralysis of the respiratory organs with possible brain hemorrhage. Might be the work of some poison, Graham. Do you know the poison that would work this? Yes, just one. In civilized countries, it's known only to a few chemists and scientists. It's distilled by jungle Indians from the upper reaches of the Amazon. Fierce little pygmy tribes with only the crudest of weapons, they dip their darts into this poison and then propel them through blowguns. Since Chief Sullivan was seated in the front row, the dart, if there was a dart, must have been fired from back of him. It ought to be easy to determine that. It's here, all right. An ordinary sewing needle. Oh, be careful, Doctor. The point may still be deadly. How would you say it was injected? By hand? No. I should say blown through a tube. What sort of a tube? Oh, any small type. Possibly a cigarette holder. What would you suggest? That a preliminary autopsy be performed immediately. After that, a person-by-person -person search for the instrument of death. Then, a thorough investigation into the motive of the crime. I will ask Lieutenant Burke to stand by with Professor Graham and myself. And I want everybody in this room to watch the persons next to them in case the killer tries to dispose of the weapon. Then, one by one, I'm going to call you to come up here and empty all your belongings on the table. Each of you who has any knowledge of a possible motive to write it down on a slip of paper which will be handed to you. You need not sign your names. The other side, please, number. Mary Ryan had made threats against the chief. That's right. Sullivan told me tonight she'd been threatening him. I did not kill him. I only wanted him to marry my Kathleen. If you killed him, I hope they punish you. You were always threatening him. Sit down, Kathleen. Your mother didn't do this. Women are not expert enough to do a job of that kind. <laughs> they kill rather crudely. Captain Perkins, you were overheard saying that you would like to be a pallbearer at the chief's funeral. Is that so? Maybe I did say it. What of it? I was sitting right here by Phillips, wasn't I? Yes, right here by me. Graham! Graham! Listen! The needle in Sullivan's back didn't kill him. He was already dead when it struck him. How do you know that? 
The wound didn't bleed. Circulation had stopped. The Slayer was not directly behind the Chief. I can show you just exactly how it was done. Oh. What is that? Get back. Get back. Get back there and sit down. I'll take charge of this. Clancy, Davis, carry him back to his room. Come on, grab his shoulders. Easy. Now listen. If I don't locate the killer within the next ten minutes, I'm going to arrest everyone in this room and give them a grilling and make the third degree look like a petting party. Don't get excited, Captain. This thing must be solved scientifically. Science can go take a jump at itself. I'll take charge here. Burke, go back to your seat. Laban, you knew Chief Sullivan was about to prefer serious charges against you. He insinuated I was building a new home with bribe money. Well, are you? You're crazy. Read this. I told the chief I'd bring a letter to prove that I inherited the money. I guess this lets you out. You've got to help me, Diana. You've got to be brave and see this thing through. There's a light switch over there. When I signal you, pull it. But I'm afraid. I'm afraid somebody else will be killed when I turn the lights out. Trust me, honey. Graham. I've got the tube the needle was shot from. Oh, you have, have you? And also the perfect solution to the crime. So have I. All right, take him with us. There's your man. What? Burke, you're under arrest. Oh, just a minute. Listen, Diana. He killed your father. He killed him because he was opposed to your marriage. Then he killed Dr. Kelly to cover up the first crime. You see, he'd known for the past half hour that I had the evidence on him. He took the only way out. Killed himself with his own poison. You'll find the deadly tube in his pocket, cleverly concealed in a cigar. It must be one of these. You see? Well, I don't think you need much more evidence. You might as well dismiss the others. So to think Burke would do this. Clear case of heredity. He was a criminal by instinct. Just like his half-brother, Johnny. And keep up high off that cigar. This looks too much like the cigar you planted on me. I knew you'd try to shoot one of your poison darts at me when you learned I had the goods on you. That's why I put the glass tabletop between us when the lights went out. Then all I had to do was play dead while you gave one of your scientific explanations. The real explanation of why you killed Chief Sullivan and Dr. Kelly. You find a poison thorn in the sleeve of Chief Sullivan's coat. It fits on the stem of this rose in his lapel. Well, what gets me is why he fired the needle in the chief's back when he was already dead. Evidently to plant suspicion on somebody sitting behind the chief. That somebody being myself. Well, this is the cigar he had when he tried to kill you. But there's no metal tube in it. Then there must be a hollow tobacco stem in it that would be consumed when he smoked. Didn't I tell you last night that a mere man hasn't a chance against a woman's intuition?
months ago. Who would have thought the world could be beautiful again, Mr. Burke? It can't help being beautiful with you in it, Mrs. Burke. Oh. Out. The spread isn't spread yet, old dear. Well, I guess I'm too lovesick to eat anyway. <laughs> I'll remind you of that tonight when you have an old-fashioned tummy ache from gobbling up more than your share. <laughs> Gee. Well, what's the latest sensation? Oh, uh, oh, nothing. What are you reading? Oh, nothing. Uh, skip it. Let me see. N now, listen, I... Oh, I, come on. I want to see you. Well, you know, it's far better that way. It's a curious thing. Terrible as his crime was, I... Uh, Somehow, I never wanted him executed. Maybe it's because I can't forget his good side. His gentleness. His sympathy. Oh, Dan, why did he have to do it? Well, only a few days ago, we discovered his diary, in which he uh, diagnosed his own case. Everything he jotted down showed the great mental crisis he was going through. There were many notations about a certain girl that he couldn't bear to lose. Well, his mind became possessed with the idea of staging a perfect crime to defy solution and enable him to win back this girl. That's what toppled his brilliant intellect across the shadow line between genius and insanity. The rest you know. Perhaps it's true that, that to understand is to forgive. Perhaps. Anyhow, that's all out of our lives now. And forever. Well, did you like the movie? I hope so, because me, my wife Judy, and production manager Dan LeClaire, we enjoy bringing you these old black and white murder mysteries from the 1930s and 40s. And if you enjoy seeing them as much as we enjoy presenting them, we invite you to join us every Thursday and Friday night at 7 p.m. and other times during the week as our schedule allows. You can see the best of them right here, black and white murder mysteries on Hastings Mystery Theater. Good evening.